Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. John Adams, he hasn't taken a break over summer. He's been busy analysing the economic and geopolitical shakeups of 2021. Uh, he is a former economics advisor to Liberal Senator Arthur Zinedinas, who is now the US ambassador. He's had a diverse career both in the public and private sector. His economic commentary has appeared in both the mainstream and alt media publications. He's also been a, a panellist on uh, mainstream media programs, as well as a, a frequent guest on alt media internet shows such as this one. He is currently the co-host of In the Interests of the People uh, with fellow economist Martin North, who's been a guest on this show. He sends out a regular email newsletter featuring his uh, commentary, and you can see the hub of his work and also links to all his social media at adamseconomics.com.au. He's the perfect person to talk to, uh, to get an overview about what is happening, not just in Australia, uh, but also the world, both in a political and economic sense. John, welcome to Wilmsfront. Thank you very much, Tim, for having me. Now, I took uh, quite an extended break over the, the summer period, but I was, of course, following the, uh, the developments, particularly over in the, the, the United States. We have uh, Joe Biden as president now, uh, though there's, there's not really that, that much that is happening there. Uh, Joe Biden is uh, ruling by executive order. The, uh, the House Democrats, because the Congress is controlled by the, the Democrats, House Democrats, they're obsessed at the moment with uh, new freshman Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And over in the Senate, we have Donald Trump's impeachment trial starting today. So pretty much the, there are a few things to, uh, to uh, um, uh, probably to unpack. Um, so um, yes, I, I mean, the Biden presidency has started off with a lot of executive orders, um, uh, trying to reverse a number of the key policy initiatives of the, in, in terms of Trump, whether it's about joining the, Par rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, um, stopping the construction, the construction of the uh, Keystone Pipeline, um, or construction of the border wall on the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, there's a whole host of extreme, uh, you know, Marxist uh, policies around uh, transgenderism that they're pushing, and a few other things like that. So um, uh, now, in terms of Congress, um, absolutely, yep. Yeah, I mean, the, the House Democrats are going after uh, House Republicans. The impeachment trial is happening, but I think there are a couple of um, important things that are happening behind the scenes in Congress, which uh, people should take note of. The big one is that um, I think last week, the US Senate passed the $1.9 trillion um, COVID relief package that uh, Biden and Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, put up. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that still hasn't passed the ha House of Representatives yet, but uh, that is a very big deal in terms of the economy. Um, so, so I, mean, I just published an article on my website this week talking how um, the Biden administration is going to accelerate stagflation. So just if your viewers don't know what stagflation is, basically it's a, um, uh, it's a phenomenon that we went through in the 1970s where you have low economic growth, uh, relatively high unemployment and rising prices. This is the complete um, antithesis of the Keynesian model because when unemployment goes up, um, due to a lack of aggregate demand, prices should be falling. And in the 1970s, prices were rising. And, and that basically um, uh, was one, against what the academics were saying. Two, that what they effectively meant for middle class Americans was that uh, their household budgets were being squeezed. Either they didn't have a job or their income was being uh, compressed by re you know reduced hours or low wages growth, etc. And as prices were rising, um, people's disposable income and living standards were falling. So um, we we definitely saw the start of stagflation happen under Trump uh, in 2020 uh, we, in terms of the lockdowns, the, the, the destruction of small business. Um, and then you had huge amounts of stimulus, both fiscal and monetary under Trump. 
um, with this $1.9 trillion package, um, that's definitely going to accelerate. Um, the Biden administration has announced a $2 trillion climate change package, which is looking at uh, clean energy infrastructure um, and, uh, you know, a, a deliberate plan to reduce carbon emissions. That's $2 trillion over four years. So between um, COVID relief and climate change, um, you're looking at $4 trillion. Where's that money going to come from? It, it's basically going to mean that the US Federal Reserve is going to um, print extraordinary sums of money. Um, even though um, in some regards I thought Trump um, was successful um, as a president. Um, I, I very much was against a lot of his economic policies. Let me give you an example. So the, the balance sheet of the US Federal Reserve was uh, uh, 3.8 trillion um, by August of 2019. Trump left office with a balance sheet at 7.4 trillion. So basically he doubled the balance sheet in his final year. And, 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 that, and that's obviously, you know, what that's meant is there is huge sums of money just sloshing around the financial system um, and we're obviously starting to see some extreme um, phenomena happening in the financial system whether it's about the, the short squeeze on GameStop um, that, 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 that basically happened there uh, where you've got a whole bunch of hedge, fund, hedge funds making huge bets with, with huge leverage um, um, and that basically blew up in their face and one of the hedge funds required a $2 billion bailout. Um, uh, and, and then obviously you've had some some dramatic action in the silver market, um, a lot, lot of uh, buzz around that. And, and I work in the uh, I work for a bullion company, um, and so I've I've been heavily involved in um, uh, analysing the gold and silver market, and and, and, and in, in terms of uh, helping uh, Australians acquire in, in terms of physical gold and physical silver. So 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 there's um, definitely um, a number of big things. Uh, happening in the financial system, um, and, and, I, and I think this with this accelerated stagflation that we're going to be seeing uh, in terms of going forward, it, it's going to mean that um, not only American middle class Americans are going to be squeezed financially. I think that it, you know that phenomenon is going to be taking place in Australia as well. Um, and for those Australians who haven't taken the appropriate um, financial precautions to protect their purchasing power, I think um, the cost of living is going to be a more uh, pressing problem in 2021. The other point that I would note that a lot of um, the mainstream media hasn't highlighted is um, for House Democrats, the first, um, um, first piece of legislation they have put forward is around um, changing election laws. So a number of the corrupt practices that were seen in the 2020 election, um, some of them illegal, um, yeah, some of them unethical, they're now trying to mandate that these practices, um, for example, mass mail-in balloting, uh, which allowed the fraud to occur um, in several of these swing states, they want this now to become um, uh, the, the level of the law in terms of federal election. So um, for all these people who say that there's nothing to see here, uh, the Democrats are, you know, pushing ahead with trying to solidify and consolidate their power in Washington by making it increasingly harder for free and fair elections. And um, that is definitely a big shame. Let's talk about the fallout from the events of uh, January 6th with what I call the bizarre storming of the capital it was just surreal the fact that in a post 9 11 national security state that could happen uh, but the the democrats and the mainstream media uh, they've been trying to turn the the storming into what i call a a christchurch moment uh, which obviously after the christchurch ma massacre in march 2019 there was a massive push for a crackdown on on far-right extremism and uh, patriots and uh, we've obviously seen the, 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 the so far the the, the FBI uh, round up uh, those who entered the the capital whether they were violent uh, uh, or not and uh, the the need to crack down on uh, domestic terrorists uh, we saw uh, Donald Trump uh, completely platform from social media he's been very quiet uh, since then his Twitter account uh, was permanently suspended we also saw some of his uh, key supporters such as Mike Flynn Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood uh, all have their their Twitter accounts permanently suspended and more recently uh, Mike Lindell the 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 my pillow founder mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and, and and CEO uh, they 
and there was for a, a brief moment the establishment republicans tried to reassert their control and uh, trying to have a cleansing of the, the the MAGA movement such as Mitch McConnell and obviously Liz Cheney voted for uh, impeachment and this is what mm -hmm. uh, Trump's trial in the the Senate is about uh, whether he incited the 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 insurrection as they call it on on, on January 6 uh, is this would you say this uh, this type of obviously the mainstream media and the the democrats raging about so-called far-right extremism is nothing nothing new but is there the new uh is there a new wave of actual persecution coming sure um yes so so probably a couple of points to make there the first one is is that um you know uh it is clear by the words of trump he said, let us march to the Capitol peacefully um, to, to, to petition the Congress. So there was no inciting of violence by Trump. Uh, that's point one. Point two is, is that the, uh, the penetration of the Capitol ground started 20 minutes before Trump finished his speech. Yes. So, um, um, and obviously there's a lot of distance between where Trump gave the speech um, and where the capital is. Um, and, and I personally have been to Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, you're talking about a fair walk between where Trump gave the speech and then in terms of the capital. So um, if he really incited people to 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 actually uh, engage in violence um, uh, during the speech, well, then those people would theoretically would have had to walk 20, 30 minutes and to, to basically get down to the Congress. And yet 20 minutes before he ended the speech, people started invading capital grounds. Now, um, during this whole time around the 6th of January, I was l looking and, and watching every piece of media that I can find on, on YouTube and uh, you know, BitChute and et cetera. Um, and one of the big things that um, you know, the Australian press won't tell the Australian people um, is that uh, this was reported by French media. The several police officers of the Capitol Police at ten, so, so Trump spoke at uh, midday in Congress met at 1 p.m. At 10 a.m., several police officers were told to go home um, um, by, 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 the, by, by their superiors. And then once the Capitol ground started being penetrated, they were never called to come back. So there was a clear stand down order um, by the Capitol Police um, so that they wouldn't have a, in terms of uh, have enough people on the ground and obviously if you look at the videotape there are clear instances of where the police are actually telling people to come into the, uh, either the capital grounds or in terms of the actual congress itself certain doors are, are left open um and people are effectively um you know uh, they're guided into the building so the whole thing stinks to high heaven um now uh, i you know I don't watch Australia, a lot of Australian TV anymore. I think most of it's fake. Most of it's contrived. Um, I do know that Four Corners recently did a show uh, about yeah, so I watched um, that as well. Yeah, yeah well, well, here's the so I haven't watched it, but some have said that uh, it was a harrowing, um, uh, a, a har harrowing episode in terms of what Four Corners put together. So I'm interested in your view about what you took from it. Is because I mean, here's the a number of years ago. Uh, Four Corners and 730 Report and all these other um, uh, uh, Australian journalists who have close links to Washington kept on pushing the Russia hoax. And we know that in 2016, everyone inside the FBI, the DOJ, the CIA, knew that the Steele dossier was completely fake. It was created by the Clinton campaign. Um, it was used as a diversion tactic away from the emails. And I mean, he, he, here's, here's the big factor um, that, that people need to understand is, um, they created a fake document that was then used to 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 present to a court to to initiate a fake investigation. Then then they started a fake media campaign through the mainstream media that that then led to a whole host of pressure that led to congressional investigations, led to a special counsel, spent forty million dollars three years, and and everyone knew from the very beginning it was fake. I mean, I mean, this has to be the biggest wake up call to Australians to say something's wrong with the American system, the American press. Um, um, you know, I mean, 
I mean, you you know, th 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 there are no such thing as independent organisations in America. I mean, you have integration between politics, between law enforcement, intelligence gathering in terms of the CIA, as well as the mainstream media. And it's one big system, one big swamp with so many interconnected relationships right, right across the board. And in the Australian press, including the ABC, were, were part of that network that was pushing this propaganda. Um, I mean, let me, let me give examples here. So you had Sarah Ferguson um, at Four Corners, I think in 2017, interviewing Hillary Clinton, saying that um, the Russia hoax was real, that, that Assange was a subsidiary of Russian intelligence. Um, yeah, it was an appalling it, it, interview. Like, sorry? It was an appalling interview. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so that was completely fake. You had Lee Sales, who in a previous career, um, or, or sorry, not a previous career, but before she was the host of 730 Report, she used to work at the Washington Bureau for the ABC. She interviewed Hillary Clinton, no hard questions, nothing penetrating, um, and, and again, um, complete bias and propaganda from Lee Sales. Um, then Lee Sales, using ta Australian taxpayer money, flies to Washington or New York, I'm not sure where the, the interview happened, and interviews Comey. Well, I mean, Comey clearly um, broke the law on multiple occasions, and, and he knew that this whole thing was fake. So so, 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 so basically, um, you have, uh, you know, the ABC pushing a lot of fake propaganda. And so when you get Four Corners now saying um, members of Congress were honestly uh, in fear of their lives um, because of these writers, I mean, it's complete nonsense. We know that there are there were Antifa, there were BLM operatives. Uh, again, I, look, so, so no doubt there were Trump people inside the Capitol. Um, um, and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, we'll wait to see how that investigation takes place in terms of um, precisely who was there, because I think that process is still ongoing. But, it, but there can be no doubt that there were people um, from the left who were there to basically instigate a riot. Now, why were they instigating the riot? Because they were trying to shut down the proceedings inside Congress. So they had 12 hours of testimony lined up um, uh, where members of the House, members of the Senate were going to present a series of, of documents, a series of evidence about the election in these six swing states um, that, would, that would have cast serious questions about the integrity of the election result. But the establishment didn't want any of that to occur. That's why they needed a, 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 a distraction so that they could actually just rush through the um, the constitutional process of, of solidifying the um, cert the certified votes and then uh, anointing Biden in, ter in terms of the president. So it, it was it was, you know, to be honest, I mean, I think the fact that Trump called for the rally and organized the rally on the 6th, it seems to be a trap. Um, you know, it looks like he got played in the sense that he provided the opportunity for his his enemies to create this diversionary tactic um, in terms of this fake rating of the capital. But 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 that obviously um, you know that 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 was able to work a, 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 in terms of a global propaganda event. And the fact that um, the the Australian Prime Minister came out um, and, and criticised. Um, Trump and criticized Trump supporters for this again appalling and you know there are big questions about um, what what does Morrison know I have some contacts who say Morrison behind the scenes is fully aware that the U US election was rigged um, uh, but his he, but obviously as a you know sovereign power he's going to just let the Americans deal with whatever they're going to deal with and we just have to accept that we have the Biden administration so now, when it comes to the persecution of, 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 of patriots or, or people who are more conservative, um, that, that, that definitely, that process is definitely underway, not just in the United States. I mean, there are things happening in the, U, in the UK. Um, and, and even in terms of Australia, there, there is a current inquiry, um, you know, in terms of the, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, um, where they're looking at, um, uh, um, uh, they're looking at extremist movements and radicalization in Australia. Um, um, yeah, um, so, so, you know, I was uh, hoping to put in a, a submission. Submissions are due this Friday. Um, you know, um, one of the one of the big things that I have an issue with uh, in terms of this inquiry is is that the law says any violence, any urging of violence, any discussion of violence against the government is completely illegal in this country, um, and, and any discussion can be, you know, um, you know. It, it, 
can be subject to criminal prosecution. Um, and, and obviously, if you look at the history of the American Revolution, uh, and that was basically um, using violence to, um, uh, to, to, to guarantee God-given rights, and you look at the history of England, um, violence is the last resort, but violence has been used throughout centuries in English history and, Amer and obviously in terms of the American, uh, the American uh, re Revolution. Um, also in terms of Ballarat, in terms of the Australian experience in 1854, to basically say when, when a government gets out of control, violence is the last option, but it is definitely a option which has been acknowledged throughout the centuries. And yet now those rights have been, have been completely extinguished. And those who, in terms of Australia, who are, um, who are upset with the direction in terms of government, um, they're, they're now being cracked down. I mean, the whole premise of this inquiry is ASIO saying there's been an explosion of um, uh, people who are chatting online, um, you know, white Australians, um, uh, late teens, early 20s, who are anti-government, who are looking at uh, so-called extreme websites um, and, and chatting amongst themselves. Um, and, 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 and that is a, a, attracting the attention in terms of ASIO. So um, now, one of the things that this inquiry won't acknowledge is, is that at the same time, you have this increase in, uh, in, in this uh, people speaking more um, forthrightly about government. You've, you've seen a complete collapse in trust in terms of government. Um, so so, so, so uh, th there are um, various surveys out there that show that Australians don't trust federal politics, they don't trust the media, they don't trust a number of our key institutions which are central to, um, uh, in terms of a civil democratic uh, society. Um, and, and, you know, rather than actually trying to crack down on so-called patriots with um, more laws or more surveillance or crack down on social media, uh, the ability to comment on social media, I think politicians need to come to terms with, well, um, they, people are upset with the, the, the direction of Australia, where we're going, the, the quality of our political representation, um, and they just need to do a better job of re-establishing trust rather than continuing the, the, the charade of um, a government that's managing the decline of Australia. Uh, and, and I should just harp on that for a second because I just did an interview yesterday where we talked about this at length. I mean, you can go across the board in terms of statistics. So whether it's about the economy, um, in terms of living standards, in terms of the amount of debt uh, households are carrying from um, educational attainment standards for our students, you can look at public health outcomes um, um, you know, whether you know, we're, we're, we're definitely more fatter and more unhealthier than we were, say, 20 years ago. Mental health is, is obviously declining. You look at narcotics use, um, um, you know, all these sort of metrics across the board shows that things are getting worse in Australia over the last two decades. And that is a cause for concern. A lot of people are unhappy. A lot of people are blaming government for a number of these problems. And rather than saying that those people who are speaking out um, are their issue. I think the, the parliamentarians need to look themselves and say, well, perhaps parliament is the issue more so than the Australian people. Let's look at the uh, coronavirus outlook for 2021. Uh, uh, we've, we've seen the, the, uh, the dark winter of the, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, infections and deaths attributed to COVID rise. It's the worst in Europe in terms of the perpetual cycle of, of lockdowns, particularly in the, the UK. So uh, this is the, the Worldometers website at the moment. As you can see, daily deaths have have gone up, but they're on a, they've started to decline, but daily cases worldwide have also declined. You could say because, well, it's it's coming close to spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the populations of those countries are beginning to be vaccinated, but there's still a, a lot of uncertainty about about where coronavirus COVID-19 is going to go in 2021 because, well, there's uh, these uh, new mutant strains uh, that uh, are being uh, reported, the, the UK, uh, Brazilian and South African 
variant, uh, uh, which is which has triggered in Australia the the Brisbane and Perth uh, uh, short lockdowns. Uh, but we're also seeing, and this is particularly uh, uh, with the the people testing positive in Melbourne, Sydney, and New Zealand after they leave hotel quarantine, these PCR tests seem to be becoming more unreliable. China reckons they have the answer by adding uh, anal swabs. Uh, Australia hasn't uh, rolled out the, the vaccine yet. There's all of this speculation and commentary uh, about whether these vaccines are efficient enough against uh, these new variants, whether they prevent uh, transmission. Then we're told the, vaccine, the vaccines in Australia uh, will be voluntary at, uh, from the, the federal government, but it sounds like they might be compulsory by stealth, uh, mandated by various uh, corporations in regard uh, uh, to allow entry to venues or, or, tr or travel. And uh, we're also seeing the, our, our hotel quarantine system in Australia. We're one of the only nation, uh, one of the only nations that has hotel quarantine for returning uh, travellers. Uh, discussions about they've always been in hotels in the inner cities, but there's all be, all these leaks attributed to uh, the, the the new strains about whether they should be moved to remote camps in in outback Australia. Uh, where do you see at the moment uh, the coronavirus uh, COVID going in 2021? Sure, sure. Um, so, so, so there's probably a couple of points to make. So, so the first point is, is that um, early on uh, in 2020, so around April, I published a 6,000-word essay on my website, um, and I went through a lot of the public commentary about COVID-19, but also the economic response. And it was clear to me early on that COVID-19 was nowhere near as lethal as what we were initially told. So the um, uh, Imperial College, Neil Ferguson, came out with a study saying that 40 million people worldwide would die from COVID-19 if we did nothing. The Doherty Institute went to National Cabinet and told Morrison that we would have 150,000 Australians die if we did nothing. Um, those models, those forecasts were completely erroneous, uh, I would say, to the extent of, uh, you know, in, to the extent of professional negligence uh, in terms of some of these forecasts. Um, and our response initially was completely um, uh, exaggerated uh, because of these uh, scaremongering forecasts. Um, and uh, on our show, um, in the interest of the people, recently we interviewed a uh, former Victorian Treasury official, uh, uh, Sanjeev Sabluk, who famously resigned from the Victorian Treasury last year uh, because he was against the stage four lockdown. Uh, I would encourage everyone uh, uh, watching the show who hasn't watched that interview to go watch because he goes into some detail about what really happened inside the Victorian government um, um, and, and, you know, and why we need a Royal Commission to understand how some of the decisions were made. Now, coming into 2021, um, uh, now one of the uh, controversial people that Martin North and I have interviewed is a guy called Professor Ted Steele, who's an Australian molecular immunologist who has a very different uh, theory about what COVID-19 is and where it comes from. Um, it's clear to me that once you start to look at some of the data and some of the observations of COVID-19, the, the mainstream media uh, explanation of the virus, uh, it, that doesn't stack up in terms of the data. So let me give you an example. So, if you look at the, you know, throughout January, if you look at, say, South Africa or Brazil, you can clearly see that there's been two unique spikes in terms of cases. Um, um, and, 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 you know, you could call them like, you know, one wave, a uh, first wave, second wave throughout, nor throughout the Northern Hemisphere, say Japan, South Korea, UK, uh, the United States, etc. You can see clear evidence that there are three unique waves. Um, in terms of the, these, you know, uh, sudden and rapid increase in cases. Now, um, some people are pointing out the uh, about the PCR test. Uh, in one of our interviews with Professor Still, we did actually talk about that. Um, PCR tests are very sensitive to the number of amplification cycles that are used. Um, there is no global uh, sort of benchmark about how, how many cycles are used uh, when the uh, PCR test is used and the case count is revealed um, within Australia overseas. Uh, health authorities are not particularly transparent about um, 
uh, in terms of how many cycles they're actually using to actually test. So, um, you know, some say that once you, you, you test uh, at amplification cycles of uh, 35 or above, um, you, you're going to get a lot of false positives. So, so that's why some people say you should be testing at uh, cycles of 10 to 20. Uh, and if you can see some strong indications of, of, of virus, um, then, then you can... Um, uh, th then, then that's more evidence of that the that the patient actually has the virus. So definitely, there are some issues with the measurement of COVID nineteen, uh, and there are, there are issues with the PCR tests. But but when you look at um, the, the the global picture, um, you know the the issue of um, the virus coming from a wet market in Wuhan in terms of animals, or whether it was released from the um, uh, virology lab uh, in Wuhan, whether it's a leak or deliberate sort of um, uh, you know, a, a deliberate release. Um, the data of how you get these explosions uh, in, in two or three cycles um, or two or three waves, uh, you know, th these explosions they they don't make sense. Um, we were, in one of our recent shows, we presented some evidence about how in the Northern Hemisphere over the last um, couple of uh, months, COVID-19, um, these cases are exploding along a particular latitude band. Um, so latitude and, and COVID-19 incidence uh, has a high correlation. And that, again, um, that has to be explained. So um, uh, Professor Still you know, says, suggests that COVID-19 is an airborne virus um it's come from a it's come from outer space it's come through a, me, uh, a meteor strike um and there's a whole theoretical outlook in terms of that but uh but the but the key uh thing that i sort of took away I from heard. sorry that's a new theory i haven't heard oh yeah so so, so yeah so um the, the 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 theory that viruses come from space through asteroids um, that, that's been well documented since the 1970s when a couple of British physicists um, did an extensive study where, where, they've, uh, put, uh, where they sort of looked at the Spanish flu and, and they were able to look at a whole host of um, other pandemics uh, and, and then come, come to a view about that. So, um, so, 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 so the basic thing, so, you know, a lot, lot, lot to uh, get into in terms of Professor Steele's work, but um, one of the things that I think is quite uh clear to me is is that i think on balance of probability and again i'm an economist not a scientist but um you know, the proposition that COVID 19 is an airborne virus i mean i i do think that there is something to that um we can clearly see that um i mean if you look at what happened last year generally the trend was um the virus was spreading from Asia to Europe to North America, then coming through South America, Africa, and then coming through to Australia. So, um, you know, there, there clearly is some patterns of COVID nineteen um, exploding in the in, in the, you know in late December, early January in in Brazil and South Africa. And if it is an airborne virus, it could well come across um, and, and strike Australia in the in, in the early part of twenty twenty one. Uh, and then when you look at um, the, this third wave of ex uh, cases exploding in, in North America um, and then in Europe as well, um, if that seeps down into the Southern Hemisphere, we could start to see COVID-19 coming again. So some people think that, that, that th this scientific analysis is completely bogus. Some people think that it's quite interesting. Um, the reason why we decided to give it airtime is, is that um, people's outlook on the virus is uh, is going to be the, the most critical factor for the economy in 2021. The other the other point is is that there is a lot of people out there who think that the worst of COVID-19 is over in terms of Australia. People are out there making significant commitments around signing up new mortgages, you know, high six-figure uh, mortgages in Perth, for example, or seven-figure mortgages in Sydney. Um, my, my personal position is, is that um, uh, the the year uh 2021 is highly uncertain uh people should um approach the year trying to be uh, flexible try to be nimble because i think there could be very sudden changes in uh in terms of income in terms of employment in terms of cash flow obligations and you want to make sure that you're in the best financial shape possible so that if if your circumstances do change quite rapidly then you're able to adjust um uh to, you're able to adjust according to the circumstances that, that you are presented with. So, so yes, so I do think that um, the saga of COVID-19 will be dragging out throughout 2021 um, and that um, people should be um, alert to that risk, um, both uh, from a health point of view, but also from a financial point of view. 
We had the, the World Health Organization last night uh, release some interim findings uh, from their investigations in, in Wuhan, China. They said that it originated from bats and got transferred to, to humans. That's, that's hardly a, a, a new revelation or conclusion. Uh, but uh, going back in, in time, uh, that's when China really started to uh, start the, uh, the you could call it the trade war or trade sanctions against Australia when we pushed for that uh, inquiry into the origins of the, the coronavirus. They're, they've obviously put tariffs on uh, barley and uh, other other Australian products that they've uh, they've been stranding ships full of Australian coal here. And we've also seen since. Uh, the coronavirus uh, broke out all over the world. China become a lot more uh, aggressive and assertive uh, geopolitically. They've pretty much completed their takeover of Hong Kong. There's more ships in the South China Sea uh, near Taiwan uh, as well. Uh, their human rights abuses, or you could say they're increasing, but there's further revelations uh, about that. It, pretty much it's not safe for a, any Australian journalist to now be in China. We uh, we, we saw that uh, Australian journalists are charged with uh, espionage, and so uh, th uh, obviously Australia lived through the uh, the, the Cold War with, uh, but that was mainly through the the United States versus the Soviet Union, where this is uh, you, you would say this is more a a Cold War emerging between Australia and China, and the the power in balance, at least population-wise, between the two. This is something that Australia has never faced before. Yeah, yeah. No, well, yes, so, 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 so probably I, um, I want to make a couple of uh, comments there. The first one is that in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, what the World Health Organization said in terms of it coming from bats, uh, I mean, so, so all I would say is, is that um, uh, when people look at some of the trends in the virus, uh, so sorry, sorry, some of the trends in the data about the virus, um, uh, the bat theory, it, 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 like that doesn't really make sense. So let, let me give you one example. So one, one of the things that's been well documented across uh, 2020 is um, various ships um, that, that were at particular ports, the crew gets tested for COVID-19, everyone, everyone is free of COVID-19, the ships go out to sea, um, they may be at sea for several weeks. All of a sudden, the the crew on the deck of the ship, um, uh, and, and, and I just want to make that distinction between the crew on the deck of the ship as opposed to other crew that may be down below or in, in the captain's office, etc. The the crew on the deck of the ship all of a sudden get struck within a 24-hour cycle, um, and and they start to get sick. So this has been documented um, in, in several instances. And when they come back to shore, they're all t the, the crew are tested, and they all have COVID-19. So um, uh, the bat theory cannot explain how is it that ships leaving from port with with no cases of COVID-19 all of a sudden get a rapid increase within 24 hours of COVID-19. So so you know that that says to me. That the you know that the proposition that COVID nineteen is an airborne virus, uh, you know, there's there's more to that than 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 what some people would be willing to initially 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 acknowledge, um, um, and and there are some scientists who have closely studied the animal jump theory and they just think that that is completely bogus so so you know so but but obviously you know we'll let the scientific community uh, play that debate out. Obviously, in terms of China, um, uh, you know. Uh, our strategic position, um, we are in, like I so we definitely are in um, a lot of trouble um, uh, in terms of vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, obviously, um, one of the big things that the that the American left tried to suppress is the leverage that the CCP has over Biden. Um, we obviously know that Hunter Biden has done some extensive uh, deals in terms of uh, with, with uh, various entities connected to the CCP. Um, the, there's obviously uh, pictures, there's all obviously videos. I've seen some of those pictures. Um, um, you know, Hunter Biden is obviously in a compromised position. Um, uh, there is definitely, I think, a clear view that there is blackmail material over Joe Biden um, that, that's going to neutralize 
whatever aggressive position that the United States was willing to take under Trump. Um, uh, in terms of in, in, in terms of where, where where does that leave Australia? Um, uh, you know, uh, so so yeah. So uh, whereas before we had a very solid ally in the U.S. who were willing to stand up for. Um, the sovereignty of ships to sail through the South China Sea, obviously stand up for Taiwan, stand up for Hong Kong, etc. Um, one one may say that um, uh, that that uh, ally in Washington is no longer as strong as, as as what it was under Trump. So that obviously places us in a um, very compromised position. Now, uh, I don't think uh, while some are uh, nervous about um, a military invasion. Uh, coming from Beijing, um, the you know one of the points that I think has to be made is is that there is no historical evidence of the Chinese seeking territorial ambition beyond its uh, recognized uh, uh, you know, recognized borders. Uh, whereas obviously Japan in the Second World War they they had a clearly different outlook. So um, you know it, it could well be that we're going to have uh, you know like you said a Cold War and luckily we're going to have economic competition. We're going to have um, uh, you know a whole host of uh, intelligence rivalries, uh, in, um, diplomatic rivalries, etc. Um, you know that that obviously uh, places us in a weak position. Obviously uh, under. Um, you know, Morrison and Turnbull, we've tried to expand some of our alliances into uh, Japan in terms of India. Uh, and obviously there's a whole host of countries are across ASEAN who also have similar concerns about China. So so, so I think that, um, it, you know, uh, things may become precarious uh, over the next uh, two years. Um, and, and we'll obviously have to see uh, how things play out. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think some of these concerns are just unique to Australia. I think some of these concerns are unique to a whole set of countries. And uh, our best um, defence is to work in alliance with uh, all those other countries that share those similar strategic concerns. And and hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully peace peace will be able to prevail. But 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 also I would make the point is is that when we talk about so so one of the things I've been talking about for the last few years about is, is about the global debt bubble. Um, and when you look at the global debt bubble, the country that has the biggest amount of uh, debt, uh, both in, in particularly around the private sector, is actually China. So, so the Chinese economy is in a very precarious position uh, in terms of itself, in terms of uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, them able to to manage um, their economy. Their economy is is clearly not in a sustainable position. It, it has a huge debt bubble, and if that debt bubble does come into some sort of problem, um, I think the CCP will have huge internal problems uh, because the the Chinese people will likely um, be extremely angry with their economic circumstances being sort of uh, you know turned upside down. So um, so yeah, so, so I think China has. Um, some some problems that Homer has to deal with, uh, but 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 I think the best thing for Australia to do is to work with our uh, uh, alliances across ASEAN, Japan, South Korea, and India, uh, as well as uh, those um, anti CCP voices in the United States, and and hopefully we can uh, muddle 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 our way through over the next uh, few years. Let's turn to Australia economic situation and the, the outlook uh, that has been projected uh, by our authorities. Uh, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg last year said that Australia's economic comeback has, has begun because we're not technically in recession anymore. The Reserve Bank Governor, uh, Philip Lowe, uh, he also spoke up the, the economic uh, reco recovery uh, last week, uh, though there's a lot of or well, you wouldn't, you could call it economic reckoning, but uh, uh, it's, it's a uh, eco, 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 economic uh, confrontations uh, that are upcoming. Uh, there's still a lot of loan, mortgage, and rent deferrals, uh, and there's also various state governments have put uh, freezes on, well, moratoriums on evictions. We've got JobKeeper to end in, end in March. Obviously, the the deficits and debts. Uh, not just in Australia, but worldwide, to, to finance programs such as a job keeper or uh, furlough schemes or wage subsidy, whatever you want to call it. 
our housing market hasn't hardly taken a hit at all. You can probably argue that, that it's been propped up by inflation because where Philip Lowe also said record low interest rates are set to uh, continue. And then the, the facts with, well, these snap lockdowns that we've had in 2021 and the, the various border closures, there's still a lot of uncertainty and the, the tourism, hospitality and uh, events industry as well like for example if you're in uh, if you're planning a wedding in Brisbane or Perth uh, during the time that they were in lockdown that would have thrown it into to, to disarray yeah yeah so yeah so, so in terms of the outlook in terms of 2021 um so, so, so yeah so, so so going back to the beginning of the conversation i mean uh in terms of the the, the uh, thesis I'm, i've come out with in terms of accelerated stagflation um uh I did a number of shows, wrote a number of articles last year, particularly using Australian uh, data to show that I do believe that we have stagflation. I do believe middle class households are feeling the pinch uh, in terms of um, either their, you know, either them becoming unemployed or their income was, was severely reduced because they had to move on to casual part time work because their industry was adversely affected. Um, and that at the same time, we've got this rapid slosh of money coming through the financial system um, you know, in terms of the RBA, uh, and not only just about the low interest rates, but they, you know, they came up with quantitative easing, the term fund uh, finance facility, et cetera, that was basically trying to suppress interest rates and to provide a, a cheap source of funding for Australian banks. So um, uh, that process, I think, will continue into 2021. Um, uh, you know, so I do think we're going to start to see uh, more inflation coming through the system. If you look at uh, global uh, commodity markets, um, whether whether it's about oil or food, uh, grain, corn, etc., um, some of these uh, commodity markets around the world, the prices are starting to go up, uh, and some of that has only been happening in the last uh, couple of weeks. So, for example, oil, I think, it was is up about ten percent over the last two two weeks. So, um, as as uh, so here's the thing. So anytime you print a lot of money, that money has to find its way somewhere in terms of the in terms of the global economy. And and to, to some extent, uh, you know, a lot of it has been going into government bonds. Uh, now we see in the United States that government bonds, uh, the, the 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 yields of the bonds have been going up. Um, and so there has been some sell-off of bonds. People are shifting world uh, across to commodities, and and you know and and, and this is a, a, a situation that uh, that was very similar in uh, during the uh, in terms of the two thousands uh, from two thousand and one through to the global financial crisis, and, um, and 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 yeah. So so for those again, those Australians who haven't taken precautions to protect their purchasing power, if they're holding a lot of Australian dollars, um, I, I, I do believe that. Um, uh, that the people's household budgets are going to become more squeezed um, going through the uh, going through 2021, 2021 and beyond. A um, couple of other points to make is that in terms of property prices, so Martin North and I just did a show last week where we talked about how Australians are splurging back on debt, um, uh, particularly around mortgages, etc. So there is a lot of activity in the mortgage uh, industry. A lot of people are seeking refinancing to improve their uh, repayment structure and their cash flow, but there is a lot of activity around new home loan applications. Those applications are mainly focused on um, land banking, land uh, um, in terms of new house, new house and land packages, uh, but also for existing uh, homes. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that if in the apartment market, particularly in capital cities, that there's a lot of vacancies. They are taking huge hits, both in terms of prices and in terms of rents. For example, Parramatta, I've heard some stories of rents falling 25, 30% uh, in terms of the peak. So um, particularly because what one of the big things that happened last year was that the insolvency laws were suspended um, and people were allowed to trade while insolvent. Um, uh, at the same time, they were getting JobKeeper. So those laws were basically uh, brought back on on 1 January. As you said, JobKeeper is going to end in March. And so I think in the small business sector, some of the pain is still being felt through um, and it could well take up to six months to, to, to really get a feel for the true financial position for a number of these small businesses. So, so I do think that there's more pain to come. And obviously if we have more lockdowns, if there is more some more explosions of COVID-19, uh, that's gonna have uh, more impact on in terms of people's uh, financial positions and particularly in terms of small business. So, so, so I do think that um, 
that uh, the economy is in a very dicey situation. Um, the reason why house prices didn't collapse last year was because they unleashed the biggest stimulus package in Australian history. And you know, one, one, one key point to make is when we had the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, there was no stimulus package. So why did they unleash the largest stimulus package in Australian history last year? It was all about protecting the, the, protecting the debt bubble. So we have the biggest household debt bubble and biggest foreign debt bubble in the country's history. And they they know that if that collapses, we'll have the biggest depression, um, um, you know, bigger than the 1892. And the, the depression in 1892, 1893 was larger than the Great Depression. So so they're trying to do everything they can to keep the, the uh, to keep the bubble together. Um, uh, and they're willing to obviously print the hell out of the Australian dollar. Um, uh, and, 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 and not only that, obviously, they're, they're willing to um, uh, uh, spend unprecedented amounts of money, um, you know, have record deficits in terms of the federal government, some of these state governments, and the amount of debt that our governments have incurred. Um, you know, we, we have no way of paying this back. Um, and, you know, we've bankrupted two generations of this. We've bankrupted two generations of Australians in order to um, try to keep this debt bubble together. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that, that's, that's the cost that we've made. And, um, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, in terms of you and I and now, uh, I don't know if you've got kids, Tim, but in terms of my children, we're the ones going to be picking up the pieces for the next two, three decades. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, purchasing power is always diluted with in inflation and what well, we've seen, you've commented on the silver surge, but there's also mm. obviously Bitcoin as well, which has continued to, to climb throughout the, the years, including uh, uh, 2020. Uh, the, the gold bugs, uh, as they're known, they're, 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 they're not... Uh, as keen on Bitcoin because it is it's it, it's not a, a physical it's it's a digital currency but it yeah. has shown itself to be entirely stable and that's also proven itself Bitcoin to be a a, a way to fight or as we've seen now payment processing deplatforming Trump has been deplatformed by payment processors. And, and banks now, so it's not just safeguarding against in, inflation, but uh, a, a financial freedom. Another layer against that uh, mass deplatforming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 no, yes. So, so um, now um, two points to make. First is is that when you look at the nineteen in the nineteen seventies, um, how did what was the best vehicle to protect your, your purchasing power? It was actually gold and silver, uh, and you had you know huge amounts of uh, return uh, in terms of the you know the gold price in US dollars went from thirty five dollars in nineteen seventy one all the way up to eight hundred and fifty dollars by nineteen eighty. The silver price went to I think from uh, about a dollar twenty six all the way up to uh, fifty dollars. So gold and silver. You know, did respond in the 1970s. If you look at what happened last year in Australian dollar terms, um, gold was up, I think, 13.7 percent. Silver was up 32 percent. So uh, compared to your traditional assets of cash bonds, uh, real estate, and uh, shares, gold and silver did its job in 2020 uh, in terms of in terms of Australia, in terms of the Australian dollar. Um, the only thing that outperformed uh, gold and silver last year uh, was cryptocurrencies. Uh, mainly, it was Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, I think it was up 250%. Ethereum was up at 300%. Um, some of the other coins were were like a, they also performed strongly as well. Um, uh, you know, the, you know, I, I've been a big silver bug for the last uh, four or five years, and uh, you know, I, I'm very deeply invested in the sector. Uh, in terms of um, cryptocurrencies, uh, there, there seems to be so. So obviously, the price is going up. Um, and if you can uh, buy these price, you know, and, and obviously one of the reasons why the prices are going up is because of the amount of money being, uh, uh, the amount of money that's being printed and, and pushed out by the central banks. So, so to the extent that you can buy and then and then sell some of these uh, cryptocurrencies in time, you can protect your purchasing power. But but I do think that there are a series of risks with cryptocurrencies that don't present themselves with physical gold and physical silver. Um, and because cryptocurrencies have only been around for 10 years, it is still 
unclear as to what is going to really happen with some of these cryptocurrencies. Um, so, uh, so, so obviously, you know, there are, you know, I think I looked at it yesterday, uh, the Bitcoin's up to $61,000 in Australian dollar terms, uh, and it, it pushed up $10,000 per coin because Elon Musk had announced that they were pumping $1.5 billion into Bitcoin. So, um, so, so yeah, so, so there are, you know, a lot of people find cryptocurrencies exciting. Anytime the like a NASA class is is exploding in price, it, it generates a lot of attention. Um, so, but the only thing I will say is is that beyond having a basic understanding of monetary economics, I think that for those who are investing significant amounts of money into cryptocurrencies, they really need to understand cryptology. So, uh, I mean, I've said to a lot of people, you know, you, you give me a Bitcoin, a bit. Uh, coin code versus an Ethereum code versus Ripple, etc., and and I just don't have the technical expertise to understand what do these coins do, how do they operate, um, how are they designed, what are the design risks, etc. And I think a lot of people are not doing their due due diligence. I think a lot of people just listen to market commentary. There's a lot of hype. The price is going up, and people are just uh, people are just jumping on the bandwagon. And uh, you know, it could work out well. Um, uh, you know, but, but but there are obviously there are voices out there who say that there there are some significant risks with cryptocurrencies, and I think people just need to uh, take a pause and do their homework before they um, commit significant funds, just in case if something does go wrong that they are not left um, uh, with significant financial losses. Now we could be having a federal election at the the end of uh, 2021, uh, though uh, we've seen uh, throughout uh, this uh, pandemic in Australia and at, uh, at probably uh, continuing in, into 2021, uh, the state's pretty much running the show and Scott Morrison, I'm coming more to the conclusion that he seems unwilling to save the Federation since, well, it now looks like the states are going to do their own vaccine rollout. It's not going to be a federal program. We've seen the state governments be rewarded at uh, elections recently for their pro-lockdown approaches. Uh, I think it's still unpredictable where the, the next federal election is going to go, given that Scott Morrison's, you would say, authority over the, the Federation has seemed to be waning and some of it of his own making. Um, yeah, yeah, and the thing is, is that so the, the, there definitely is some very interesting dynamics between the Prime Minister and some of the Premiers. Um, the, the, the point I will make is, is that um, Labour is in, 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 is in complete disarray at the federal level. Um, you know, I was talking to a, a Canberra Press Gallery journalist last week and we had a, an extensive conversation for about 45 minutes. Uh, I've been told that there is a formal destabilisation campaign against Albanese. Um, he hasn't impressed anyone. Um, um, and, and basically people want to change. Um, you know, there are a, a number of big factors around the opposition. And, you know, one, one, one of the big things that... Um, People, I think, I think people should draw out from the 2019 election. So it is true that governments typically lose elections. So um, if a government is not performing, people will revolt against the government and vote in the opposition. But the opposition still has to be viable. And you know, the shortened opposition in 2019 was completely unviable, both in terms of its tax policy, but also in terms of some of its radical social agenda. Um, Labor has a, a, an identity crisis between its blue, traditional blue collar, uh, social conservative working class um, uh, 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 stakeholder group, if I could use that term, and, and then in terms of some of these green progressive left uh, supporters who who come out of university and, and they're trying to try to keep that coalition together. But I think that coalition has been uh, fretting uh, in terms of the seams and th 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 there's clearly frustration inside labor as to where they should go. So when, for example, when it comes to energy generation, I mean, Joel Fitzgibbon coming from the Hunter, um, you know, one nation has made significant inroads into his seat. Um, because of uh, you know uh, their position on uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, 
a coal fire power um and and obviously he's felt the pinch around that so so you know th there's a whole host of things around uh, social policy in terms of uh, you know whether it's about uh, the australian uh, about australia day the australian flag the anthem um uh, in terms of uh, you know in terms of general economic policy uh um and 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 and, and you know and, and and then obviously when you look at energy and some of these other sort of issues um you know labor doesn't have a clear direction and their camp is, is quite split within the other the other thing i would say is is that i believe and i've said this uh, privately to a number of people is anytime i interact with labor politicians they just don't have the will to win um they don't look like they are they, they don't come across to me in private meetings as they want to be in government that, that they are wanting to take australia in a particularly strong direction um i mean you know you know there isn't a, a conviction politician in, in the alp that i can find um a lot of these people are there um because of the gravy train two hundred thousand dollar plus salaries um and a lot of people are just going along to going along to uh because because they're because they're on a particularly good wicket so um so yeah so albanese doesn't come across as um a strong leader who is talking about the issues of the day um and who's willing to take the country in a particular direction and actually capture the imagination of the uh australian people it, you know one of the interesting things that i was told was that uh over the summer break albanese has been working his tail off doing hundreds of like you know, maybe about 100 events and doing several interviews and uh, speaking at a number of engagements and i said well i haven't noticed he seems invisible to me and um and this journalist said that a number of his labor colleagues have said the same so you know have it put that in contrast with trump Trump just has to have one press conference and everyone's watching, um, and he's he knows how to get people's attention. So, um, so I do think that there could be a change in the Labor leadership. Um, now, there are some some plebiscite probably has said she she wants it, but she wants it given to her. She wants it presented to to her in a bloodless clue, uh, coup, as opposed to her you know damaging her public image by attacking Albanese. Um, I don't think she's going to be an effective leader of the opposition. Neither do I think Albanese is. Um, is there a third option? Um, not sure. Um, I don't think they'll go back to Shorten because I think he's been uh, tried and, and, and tested and, and he hasn't um, uh, you know he hasn't generated the support among the Australian public. So so I think I think um, Morrison um, while there are some issues between him and some some state premiers, I think uh, versus the Labor opposition, I think he's in the box seat. And um, uh, you know, uh, so so obviously things can change um, if there is a dramatic economic crisis or uh, if there is a huge scandal, etc. That 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 does come out um, uh, like between now and the election, things can change. But at this stage, I think um, Morrison's in the box seat, and uh, I'd be banking on the re-election of the Morrison government. Well, John, I uh, thoroughly appreciated you sharing your uh, knowledge, expertise, and insights uh, on on the show. And uh, I'll uh, certainly uh, be eager to hear later down the the, the track, or who, who knows what, what's going to happen. Really, so some further insights and analysis from you. I encourage everyone to sign up to your newsletter at uh, adamseconomics.com. Fantastic! Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.